right. Some winter music for you guys to enjoy today and a little blast of winter to close out February. So thanks for coming out today, making it here safely. Wish you guys the best of luck throughout the rest of the day. Stay warm. Um, good day to sit inside and write computer code. Um, that's what I'll be doing later. So, okay, so today, let me sort of give you a map for the next couple classes just to get a sense of what we're, what's going on here. So today we're gonna talk about this new concept in object-oriented programming called polymorphism. It's a big word, sounds sort of scary, isn't scary, and something you guys will get, as always, plenty of practice. So we're gonna in introduce that. This also gives us a good chance to review inheritance, which is a concept that we started talking about on Monday. On Friday, remember you got no class. So it's a good day to spend that extra time working on MP1. We'll have office hours as usual. Um, you know, getting to the point where you guys are wrapping up that MP, uh, that would be a good thing to do on Friday, uh, but we won't be here at 10. Um, on Monday, we're going to come back and we'll basically spend Monday kind of reviewing and refreshing our object knowledge. If you took the quiz this week already, you've noticed that we're sort of playing catch up with the quizzes a little bit. We had the midterm during the week where we started talking about objects, so this is our first real quiz about objects. And so, you know, eventually we'll be at the point where the quizzes will be a little bit more about last week's material, but we're sort of catching up over the next couple weeks. But Monday's a good day to just kind of stand back, talk a little bit about uh, objects, give you guys a chance to ask some questions, we'll do some examples, uh, try to clear up any misconceptions you might have at that point. Um, and then on Wednesday, we'll talk more about polymorphism. So we're coming back to a topic. You know, one of the things, you know, that, that I think is, um, I remember, I, I took a class years ago, a graduate course uh, on cryptography, which is really a fascinating class. It was taught by a guy named Michael Rabin, who's just super famous. Um, he's, um, you know, I think he's a Turing Award winner, which actually we're going to talk about. It's a good story for me to tell today. Um, the highest award in computer science. And my friend was actually one of the, on the course staff for the class. And at some point he pointed out to me, he said, you know, if you listen carefully to Michael when he teaches, he was a fantastic teacher. He said, he says everything twice. Um, sometimes he would say it twice, like literally back to back. Um, but sometimes he would say it twice, you know, spaced out by a few sentences. And that's something, particularly when we're dealing with some of these more complex concepts like polymorphism, I think it's a good thing to do. So you guys get to see this today, start to chew on it a little bit, and then we'll come back and review it again on Wednesday, right? So a little bit of spaced repetition. Okay, so last time we talked about inheritance and we looked at the Java extends keyword that allows us to establish a relationship between a class that we're creating and some other class. And we looked at some of the basics, which we're gonna continue looking at today, of how those two classes are now related and the types of ways in which we inherit behavior and state from one class to another. So one of the questions is why do this at all, right? Why establish this type of uh, design pattern? Why does Java let me do this? It's not required, I could just have every class be required to stand on its own. And there's other languages that have different models for establishing relationships between classes. One way to think about this though is that by providing the extends keyword, we're essentially organizing our classes, our categories, into a hierarchy. So I'm using a little bit of just a taxonomy of animals that I pulled off the internet somewhere. Um, and so you'll see, you know, and, and if you've taken like a biology class or like the anthropology class that I've been kind of listening in on before this, you know, this is a common thing that zoologists, biologists try to do, right? We try to break things down into categories, but they're not just categories, we're also trying to group them in a certain way, right? So as we go up this tree, we get to more general categories, bigger categories that contain more diversity, right? So mammals, as a category of living thing is a huge category. It includes all sorts of different things. Here's our, here are four different examples of kinds of mammals, and this is not like the official tax, taxonomy that zoologists have come up with. This is just you know, an example. Um, and of course, it's not complete. There are many, month, or many more types of anim, mammals that I'm sure you can come up with. But each one of these is now a smaller category. It's a subcategory of the bigger category mammal. And those subcategories, many of them, all of them up here, including cats, although they're not included, uh, but we see for dog and horse, we can continue to break down those subcategories into smaller categories. 
So the way that Java allows us to arrange classes and establish relationships between them is partly because it mimics or mirrors a way that we establish relationships between real things in the real world, right? We think about as we go up this tree, our categories get bigger, but they also get more diverse. There's less in common about them. There's more in common about every dog than there is about every mammal. There's more in common about every German shepherd than there is about every dog, right? So as we move down, we're getting to more specific categories that encompass more, that allow us to say more about that particular type of object or that particular creature in this case. As we go up, we're moving to categories that are more general, but where the things that those members of that category have in common are fewer. So let me use a different example. Uh, we've talked about you guys before as being in a category of students, but you're also in a category of residents of the state of Illinois. You're also in a category of uh, residents of the United States. Some of you are in the category of U.S. citizens. Some are not. You're all in the category of human being, right? Uh, and then you're also in this category, right, with other mammals. So, you know, if you think about yourself in relationship to all the other mammals, what do you have in common? Well, you do have some things in common. That's why you're in a group together. But if you think about yourself in relationship to all the other students in this class, you have more in common with them right now than you do with students at this university generally or residents of the city of Urbana or Champaign, et cetera, right? But you still belong to all those categories. And today what we're gonna talk about is a feature of Java that allows you to act as a member of different categories depending on the context. And that's actually something, again, that mirrors real life, right? Sometimes when, like, you go to the DMV, if you need to get your driver's license or something, you're now a citizen of the state of Illinois, right? The fact that you're uh, also a university student is sort of irrelevant, right? So one reason we do this is because it, it expresses these real-world taxonomies, right? That's one of the reasons to organize things in a class. But it also allows us to reuse code between our different classes. So this is not only, you know, one of the things that's interesting about object taxonomies is not only that they are an expression of real world reality, but also that they allow us to write better code, right? Um, they allow us to set up our classes so that shared functionality is moved into a class that several other classes inherit from. Specific functionality to those classes is now in those classes, and I don't have to duplicate all of the functionality that I moved to the parent. We'll see some examples of this. All right, so what does this look like for Java? All right, so Java has a very specific idea about how to organize its class hierarchy. We talked last time about the fact that in Java, I can only extend one other class. That means that I only have one parent. And that means if I look at all the Java objects out there, I can organize them into what's called a tree. It's the data structure that we'll come back to in a minute. But you'll see here, as I'm going up, these connections are expressing a, a relationship between a child and a parent class, right? And again, think about the child as being a more specific version of the parent. So every letter, right, um, every vowel is also a letter, which is also a character. Every consonant is also a letter, which is also a character. Every digit is a character. Um, and at the top, so this is one of the other things that's, that's interesting about Java, at the top of this tree, there is a single root. And this gets a little bit confusing, and I'll try to be as specific about it as possible. But at the top there is capital O object. This is an actual class in Java. So this is, again, where it gets a little bit, you know, it's like we'll talk about objects. Sometimes when we talk about object, we're talking about instance of a class. When I talk about capital O object, I'm talking about the class that every single Java object inherits from. So what's implied here, by the way, is that if you don't use the extends keyword, you still have a parent. You're still extending capital O object. So these two things are equivalent. You don't have to extend capital O object explicitly if you don't indicate that you have a parent through the extends keyword, you will automatically be assigned capital O object as a parent. And we'll see what the implications are for the, uh, of that in a minute. Well, we'll see them right now, actually, and then we'll play with this in a minute, okay? So the, the result of this is that any methods, so think about it. I inherit methods in state 
from all of my ancestors, right? So if, my, my, if I extend a class that defines a method, I inherit that method. We'll look at how I can change that method in a minute, but, I, but by default, I inherit that method. So instances of a class that extends another class inherit all the methods defined on its parent. Now, because every object in Java extends capital O object, whatever methods capital o object has are available to all Java objects. So every single object in Java has a small number of methods that it inherits from capital O object. And so we're going to talk about these. In fact, these are actually really important to programming in the Java programming language. We're going to talk about three of them during the rest of the semester, right? Um, and, these are, and these are the most important ones. Now, if you go to the Java documentation, you can find that there's a whole list of these. I think there's maybe 15 or something like that. Um, but for our purposes in this course, these are the ones that we're going to care about, right? First one, we've already used this one, is toString. ToString is primarily a debugging tool. This is designed to allow you to inspect information about objects as your program is running or as you're debugging it or as you're trying to figure out what's happening, right? Okay? But every single object has this method, okay? Equals. This is another method that every object has. Now, toString, you'll see, is a method that returns a string, takes no arguments, okay? So this essentially says, here's a way to convert this object into a useful string representation because then I can print it to the console and you can look at it as your, again, as your debugging code. Equals. Equals is equality. This is, allows you to define whether or not an instance of your class is equal to another instance of some other class. Could be your class, could be another class. So equals takes an object as a parameter and returns a Boolean. So this is true or false. And again, equality turns out to be something that's very important to define. We'll talk a little bit later about what we get out of doing that. And we'll talk, show you some ways to do it. The final one, and this is gonna come to play in like about a month after spring break, is something called hash code. And this one, I don't expect you to really understand yet, but we will explain it later. Um, this returns, the idea behind hash code is that you're supposed to return an int that uniquely defines the contents of that object. Um, this turns out to be incredibly important for having certain basic data structures work in Java, but we'll, this is the one we'll get to later, right? We'll come back to this month and a half, and you guys will sort of forgotten about this, and I'll remind you that this is the third capital object method that we're going to think about. Okay. So here's another feature of inheritance that we haven't discussed yet, which is that you can override a method that you inherit from a parent or an ancestor. This is frequently done with the default object methods because the default implementation of these methods is not very helpful. We'll see what the default toString method does in a minute, for example. But if you actually want to print off some useful information about your object, it's very, about your class, it's very rare that you actually want to use the built-in toString method, right? So we'll, we'll look at how to do that. Essentially what you do is you define a method with the same signature in your class and then that is the method that gets used when that method is called on an instance of your class rather than the default. But again, we'll look at how this works in a second. You know what, let's, I'll, I'll come back to this. So let's do this first. All right, so the, so I've got this fairly kind of silly convoluted two or three level object hierarchy here, right? Where I have an animal class and then I have pet extends animal. Pet is a kind of animal, the subcategory of animal. Uh, dogs is a subcategory of pet, old dogs is a subcategory of, of, of dog, sweet old dogs is a subcategory of old dog, um, limping dog is a subcategory of sweet old dog, that's the category that our dog is in right now. Um, and then, and here, and here's what we're gonna do, so we're gonna print to string, and for now, let's get rid of this. Okay, so let's remove the animal implementation. So what am I doing here in my main method? What code's gonna run? So on line eight, I'm creating a sweet old dog, I do that, default constructor, and then I'm gonna print it. And as we talked about last time, this works because of inheritance. Uh, if I can get rid of the check stylers. There we go, okay. 
So this works. Now what's being printed here may not make a lot of sense, right? What you're seeing here is the default implementation of toString provided by the object class, okay? So the object class doesn't really know anything about my object. And so all it can do is it prints the name of the class, and then a, this is actually a memory reference, right? That, that string of digits over there, if I run this a few times, you'll see that that's gonna be different every time I run it, right? Okay. Let's say, okay, so let's do the following things. First of all, let's get, let's give our dog, let's give our, our animal, let's give our pet a name. Let's say, um, so what I need to do is I'm gonna say, and I'll just make this public for now, and I'll create a constructor for animal. Well, you know what, let's not create a constructor for animal. Let's just do this, okay? And then let's set choo-choo.name is equal to choo-choo. Make sure that this still works, okay? And now imagine that I want my sweet old dog class to print the name of the sweet old dog and the fact that it's a sweet old dog. Okay, so that, this is what we'll do. So how are we gonna do this? So what I need to do is I need to override this method. So if I look back at these methods that I inherited from, from object, two string is the one that I wanna use here. Okay, so two string looks like this. It returns a string. It takes no arguments. I have to mark it as public. This needs to be something that I'm sorry, I've been writing too much Kotlin. I'm getting confused about where my modifiers go. All right. So I just need to return a string here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna return um, name, and then I'm just gonna follow that by something, okay? There you go. All right, so let's pause here. I know we didn't run a lot of code. This is some like leak code or something. But there, there, there's some conceptual challenges here that I acknowledge, right? So I just want to stop, and we'll pause, and I'll take questions about this. We'll talk a little bit about what's happening, right? And we'll play with this a little bit, and we'll see how we can induce some different kinds of behavior. All right. So first of all, what happens when I run to string? So before I overrode the method, here's what was happening. So let's comment this out. Run it again, I get the old behavior. Add this method and run it, and now I get the method I want. So what's happening here? All right. So I created a sweet old dog, I set the name. Why can't I set the name here? Sweet old dog doesn't define a name instance variable. Why am I allowed to do that? Yeah. Yeah, it inherits the name from pet, right? So again, in my world, every pet has a name. I feel like that's sort of, to be honest, one of the defining qualities of a pet. Not every animal has a name. Some animals have names. But if you have a pet, it has a name. I don't know. It's just, I just think that's probably reasonable. So in, um, in my sweet old dog class, I'm setting, um, well, actually down here on line 15, I'm setting the name of the sweet old dog. And the name is actually a variable that sweet old dog inherits from pet through old dog through dog. So I inherit all of the variables uh, provided by uh, any of my ancestor classes. Okay. So now when I call to string, here's what happens. So I call choo choo dot to string. Java says, okay, what kind of object is choo choo? Choo choo is a sweet old dog. That's how I created him on line 14. If you, here's the thing, so you don't get confused, because this is about to get a lot more confusing. If you want to remember, if you want to figure out what kind of object a particular thing is, look to the right of new. So here, to the right of new, I see sweet old dog. The reason why I'm saying this is because in a minute, we're gonna see that this might not say sweet old dog, it may say something else. But if this says new sweet old dog, what I have created is an instance of sweet old dog. Now I set the name, the name is something I inherited from pet, and now I say print choo choo to string. So when Java goes looking for this method, here's what happens. It says, okay, is there a two string method defined 
in the sweet old dog class? And the answer in this case is yes. I define one right here on line eight. If it doesn't find one, it goes to the parent. This is one of the reasons why Java enforces the rule that every class can only have one parent. Because if I had two parents, I might find two different uh, implementations of two string, and I wouldn't know which one to use. But if I have one parent, my algorithm is look in sweet old dog. If I find a method called two string that's public and returns a string, use it. Otherwise, check old dog. Otherwise, check dog. Otherwise, check pet. Otherwise, check animal. Otherwise, check object. And I know object's going to have this method. All right. So now, let's try doing this differently. Uh, so I'm going to add a two string method to animal. I'm going to say my pet is, is named. Okay, and it's mad at me because I need to return this. Okay, so now I added another two-string method, but I'm still seeing the same behavior. The reason is Java stops as soon as it finds a two-string method that it can use. Let's try doing this. What happens if I change this to private? Any guesses? What's going to happen now? What's the venture guess? Yeah, in the back. Oh, sorry. Okay, let me let me change the name of this instead of calling it two string. Let's call it to string, there we go. Okay. So now, what happened? I called, I created a sweet old dog, that hasn't changed. I set its name and then I called a two string method on my sweet old dog. What Java did is it said, okay, does sweet old dog define a method called two string that you know, has the right name, takes no parameters, returns a string? The answer is no, because I misspelled it, right? Or called it something else. So then it looks in old dog. Then it looks in dog. Then it looks in animal, and it finds a matching method. So it uses it. So now I get the string that's being returned by the two-string method on line four, right? So the key things to understand here is that Java will look starting in the class that the object is, Choo Choo is an instance of sweet old dog. That's what's to the right of new. So that's where I start looking for a method to use. It will then walk to the parent, to the parent's parent, the parent's parent, all the way until it gets to object. If it finds a method that matches the signature it's looking for, it will stop. One of the things I want to point out about this that's kind of nice is that I can use, if I call println and I pass it something that's an object, it will automatically call toString for me. This is like a little bit of magic built into Java. Right? So I don't have to call toString. What I've done is I've told Java now how to print toString, and so I can pass my sweet old dog variable directly to the print method. Right? It knows what to do. Questions about this before we make it a little bit more interesting? Questions? Yeah. Yeah, so let's try, do you want to try both changing the name and making it private? Yeah, okay, so let's change the name to, to sweet string and we'll make it private. And now essentially what happens is that I'm looking for a method called to sweet string. Sorry, to string. And to sweet string doesn't match the name, right? So the fact that it's private is sort of irrelevant at this point, right? Uh, if I tried to call it, I wouldn't be able to call that method because it's private. That makes sense? Good question. Other questions? All right, so like, let's, okay, let's say, um, you know, so a sweet old dog should have like a sweetness level, right? 
So I'm going to add an instance variable to my sweet old dog. Uh, and I'm going to make this a double. And by default, we'll set it to zero. But let's also create a constructor now for my sweet old dog. And we'll say that I have to set the name and the, sw the sweetness level of the dog. Um, so here I'm going to do name is equal to set name and uh, sweetness is equal to set sweetness. And now in here I'll pass choo choo and I don't know what scale this is on. Maybe it's on zero to, let's say zero to one. Uh, I'll give Chuchu a 0 0.8 today. He hasn't pooped on the floor yet, so that's when he does that, sweetness level goes down. All right, so right now this is going to work the same way. All I did was add a constructor. Okay? But now I sort of feel like when I print off information about my sweet old dog, I should include the sweetness level of the dog, right? Okay, so let's try this. Okay, so I, for now, let's just ignore this two-string method we have down here. Let's just try to put it up here, okay? Um, I'll say with sweetness level sweetness. Okay. What is going to happen now? Yeah. An error. Okay, why? Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so the question is, can the parent access the variables of the child? And the, the answer is, it can't, but why not? Someone explain this to me. This isn't just like an arbitrary decision on behalf of Java. It's actually important. Why can't I access? Yeah. Bingo. Not every descendant of pet has a sweetness level. So what if I create, instead of a, a dog, right, so it's basically going to say I can't find this variable. What if I tried, you know, what if I created an instance of um, dog, I think of a, okay, there's a dog on our street. Let's say I wanted to print just a, a normal dog, not a sweet old dog, a young dog. Right, so my, my dog class also extends pet, but it doesn't have a sweetness level. So the problem here is that not every pet has a sweetness level, only some of them do. And so I can't print the sweetness level when I'm printing a pet because my dogs and my old dogs don't have sweetness levels. And I might have cats, which definitely don't have a sweetness level, right? Um, so how do I work around this? I still want to print the sweetness level when I print out my sweet old dog. How do I do it? So again, if I'm running this program and I want to kind of like, again, if a dog's acting up, I want to figure out what's its sweetness level, how, do I, how can I accomplish that? Do you have any suggestions, guesses? When I print off my sweet old dogs, I want to see the sweetness level. If I print off a dog, I don't have a sweetness level to look at. So maybe I'll just print the name. How can I do that? Guesses? Anyone have something they want to try? Give me a suggestion about how to do this. Yeah. We can define what? Oh, okay. So someone says, why don't we move sweetness into the dog class? Okay, so that's interesting. So, but the question is, is every dog sweet? I mean, every dog that's a pet, somebody thinks it's sweet, but we may disagree. Um, so, the que so I could move the sweetness level up so that more categories of dog have a sweetness level. But will that help me with my pet two-string method? Let's, I mean, let's try it. It's a reasonable suggestion. So let's say 
Let's move the sweetness level into the dog class. Okay. Now, my sweet old dog constructor works the same way. Now it's just setting the sweetness level that's defined up there. I still have the same problem. All right. So there is a solution here that would work that's similar to what we just did. What would I have to do? So this is one approach to this. I'm gonna talk about why it's not the best approach, but I'm almost there. If I want this to work, where do I need to define my sweetness level? Yeah. What's that? Okay, so let's try putting the old dog class. Okay, so again, so let's move it in here. Same problem. Yeah. Yeah, process of elimination, right? So I'll put it in the pet class, right? Let's see if that works. Okay. So that works. But what, what's wrong with this? Why might I not want to do this? So what I'm doing actually is I'm now saying that every pet has a sweetness level. And maybe you think that, but maybe you feel like sweetness level is something that only sweet old dogs have. So, so essentially what we've done is we've changed our definition of what it means to be a pet. Before what it meant to be a pet was you had a name. You were an animal that had a name. Now you're an animal that has a name and a sweetness level. So I don't like that. I, I wanna put this, I want this where it was. Because I don't think that every pet has a sweetness level. So what's the other way to solve the problem? Yeah. Yeah. Remember what we did before? We overrode two, str two string in sweet old dog. So now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to move this down here. I'll collapse these two strings together. It's private still, let's make it public again so it can actually do what we want. There you go. So now the idea is, and, and, and this, this example, again, this is worth thinking about, right? You know, this example is highlighting these features of Java's class system. So if I move uh, instance variables up, that means that requires that more classes have them in my hierarchy, right? If I move them down, it means I need to provide more specific behaviors for those classes. So if I want to print the sweetness level, sweet old dog has to override string. On some level, the two string method of sweet old dog is the only two string method that knows everything about that, right? Because if I go up one class, I may lose an old dog doesn't have a sweetness level, right? Okay, questions about this example. This is a good one to think about how the Java, Java's inheritance model works. This is tricky stuff. I am not lying. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we could. I mean, you, are you just saying, can we just make this private? We don't even need a getter right now because the two-string method is defined on the class itself. Right? So this will work fine. Right? So the question is, can I make this private? The answer is yes, because the only way I'm, place I'm using sweetness right now is inside the class. Right? If I wanted to get at it like outside here, then I would have to provide a getter for it. Yeah, absolutely. Good question. So I can use my getter and setter design pattern here as well. Okay, good. All right, so we, talk, okay, so we talked about this. We talked about super last time. So good. To, let's go back and do this here, actually. Um, now this is going to get messy with this example. It's too deep. All right. So l l let's look at another example. So we talked. Uh, I don't think I actually even presented this last time. So let me slow down. Breathe. All right. So Java classes provide constructors. Um, if I want to run, so there's many cases in which I want to run my parents' constructor. 
right? I want to make sure that my, if I extend another class, I need to make sure that class is set up properly first. The way I can do this is I use a keyword called super. In a child, super calls the parent's constructor. This is another one of these special keywords, like this, or whatever, right? So the, it has to be the first thing I do in a constructor. So let's look at what happens here. I have a smaller example where I have a pet and a dog. Dog is still extending pet. Every pet has a type that's a string, and it has a constructor that requires that I pass the type in. So I actually can't create a pet without telling you what type it is. It kind of makes sense, right? I want to be able to make sure that I can keep track of all the different types of pets. So in my dog class, my dog constructor takes a single argument that sets the breed, right? So dogs have breeds, not every animal has, has that uh, feature, so that's a good thing to put in my dog class rather than in pet. In my dog constructor, the first thing I do is I call super, which calls the parent constructor. So because I've extended pet, when I call super, my parent constructor runs. I pass the type of pet that I am, that gets set on my parent, and then I set the breed here directly using the past argument. All right, so let's see how this works in our, in our playground. So you'll see that what happens when I run this code, I'm creating a new dog, the type of dog, the breed of dog is mutt. That's the kind of dog Juju is. When this happens, I call super. So this is the first constructor that runs. It sets the type of the dog. And then I set the breed to mutt. And then when I print off the type of my dog object, I'm seeing dog. Dog is defined not on, the type is defined not on the dog class, but on its parent pet. All right, so this is, a, you know, again, a common way of doing multi-level initialization. So when I set up my dog class, I call super to set up the parent class first, and then I do any additional initialization that I have to do. All right, good. All right. Well, actually, let me stop, because I have about 10 minutes left. This is a good place to pause. Any questions about super? You guys will have some chance to use this in the future. What happens if I don't call super here? Let's try it. Okay, so now, the pr what's happening? So now in my dog class that extends pet, if you don't call super, what do you think Java does by default? What does it try to do? If I don't call super and, and pass some arguments and actually call one of the parent constructors directly, what do you think Java does instead? How can I make this example work without calling super? Anybody have a guess? Yeah. No, I, no, I can't, th that's not, so, the, so the, the, the question is, what if I just set type directly? Will this work? No. What do I need to do? What's, what's, what, what is the error message telling me here? Why don't, we, why don't we look at it? It says, constructor in class pet cannot be applied to no arguments. So it's saying here that there is a constructor defined in pet that takes a string, but I'm trying to call a constructor that takes no arguments. So essentially, if I don't call super, that's equivalent to calling super with no arguments. It's basically equivalent to doing this. Now, why can't I call super with no arguments here? It's a good review. I mean, seems like a reasonable thing to do. Why can't I do it? What would I need to fix to get this example to work? Someone give me a suggestion for a starting point. You guys hiked all the way here in the snow today to do this? Come on. Help me out. Yeah. 
yeah, I need a, I need a no argument constructor in the pet class. It's one way to solve this problem. So right now, I've only defined a way to create a pet that requires a type. If I was okay with you not requiring the type, I could do something like this. Say so type is unknown. Now this will work. Right. Now again, that's not necessarily what I want to do, because maybe I want to force you to provide a type. So if I wanted to force you to provide a type, I do what I did before. I don't provide the no argument constructor, and I force you to tell, if you're gonna, if you're gonna inherit from pet, you have to provide a type when you create your class, right? So now I know that every pet is gonna have a type that's set in the, in the child class. Okay, good. So now, you guys seem like you're in the mood to, for contemplation. Let's talk about polymorphism. So again, this is one of those concepts that comes up in this class, um, and this is a challenge to wrap your mind around, but it's also a good way to solidify your understanding of the kind of class relationships that we've been talking about establishing and utilizing in our code, right? So if you can understand polymorphism, it requires sort of getting through understanding these class relationships and how Java is using these um, to, 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 it, as it runs and compiles. Okay, so, well, so what does polymorphism mean, first of all, right? Polymorphism essentially means that a single thing can act, a single object, a single instance can act like members of two different classes. And again, as I was saying before, this isn't such an unnatural idea. So, you know, you guys have one way that you behave because you're in CS125, right? And then there's other contexts where you're interacting with the university where the fact that you're a student in the class is sort of irrelevant. Right, you're just a university, like you go to the, the counseling center, or you go to one of the dining halls on campus or something. And then there's other times that you interact in a way that's tied to your, you know, to your country of origin, right? When you're traveling, you have a passport, but it's a tied to a different identity. You were all of those things at the same time. The identity that you use in a particular situation is a function of the context that you're in, right? The only thing that's specific to Java here is that these are part of this class hierarchy, right? So we're gonna identify, there's actually several different types of polymorphism. Polymorphism is a general concept. For now, we're gonna look at two of them that we've seen already. One of them that we've just been utilizing on some of our examples. So in order to act like two different types of thing, you actually have to be two different types of thing. And in Java, it's worth pointing out that every object can be considered a member of at least two classes. Every object is actually two different types at the same time. It's whatever you declare it as, and also an object. And it can be more than that, depending on if it's part of an object tree or a class tree. So every pet here is also an object. As a pet, it has a method called printme, right? So as a pet, I can call a method called printme. Is an object, it has a method called toString and equals and hash code and all those built-in object methods. So as it's moving around in your program, it's both a pet and an object at all times. And again, depending on the class relationships you uh, extend in your hierarchy, this can get even more complicated, right? So now every dog is simultaneously a dog, a pet, and an object. As a dog, it has a method called printme, and also uh, that it overrode from pet, so it has its own version of printme. As a pet, now it doesn't have any special behavior because it, it overrode this method, but as an object, now it has equals and two strings, and hash code and the other object methods. We've seen, oh, okay, so let me, we're gonna talk a little bit about casting, right? So objects, if, if I want to an object to behave like one of its ancestors, Java will do this for me automatically, okay? So let's look at, again, these, these are these places where we just get into these fun conceptual tangles, right? So look carefully at this piece of code and tell me what is weird about it. There's something in here that up until this point should not have made any sense to you. If you looked at this, again, on a quiz, you would have said there's an error. 
Something's wrong with this. What's the problem? Okay, so I'm creating an object of type dog and an object of type pet. I've established this little hierarchy here where dog extends pet, pet extends object implicitly. And then I'm calling this static method called print anything, and I'm passing it first a dog and then a pet. What is weird about this? Again, like if I, up until now, if I showed you this on a quiz, it would have been, I, I would, you would have been legitimately correct to say that this is wrong. This doesn't match your model of the world. It turns out that it works. But what, again, what's off here? Yeah. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm not sure, I think you're, are you referring to two string? So that's not what I'm looking at here. I'm looking at something else, yeah. No, that's okay. So the question is, can I define a method after I use it? Yeah, I can do that in Java. What is the type of the parameter to print anything? It's a capital O object, right? I know that, you know, this is, we're sort of starting to see objects now being used in the type of a parameter to a method. Before this would be int or long or whatever, but this is just normal, right? This says that this print anything method takes an object called to print. What am I passing to it on line 11? Oh, somebody just scratch it. What kind of object am I passing to it on line 11? What's the type of choo-choo? It's dog. What type am I passing to it on line 12? It's a cat, right? Created this, or sorry, a pet. Yeah, this is, she gets angry with me about this example. She says, I'm a cat. Right. Anyway, and here she's just a pet. So this doesn't seem like it should work, right? This takes an object variable, not a pet or a dog, and yet it works. This code runs, and you'll see that it uses the correct toString method. So when it calls toString on the dog, it gets the toString method that I overwrote in the dog class. When it calls toString on pet, it gets the default object to string method. So the question is why, right? Why does this work? Right? Well, actually, you know what? I'm not going to go there yet. We'll get, we'll get there on Monday. Um, so this is an example of what we just talked about. Every dog can also act like an object. Every pet can also act like an object. And so I can automatically pass them to any method that accepts an object as a parameter. I can actually pass any Java object to this print anything method. It doesn't matter what kind it is. I could pass a string. The reason is polymorphism. So because every Java object can act like a capital O object, they can all be used in this method. Now, why is that? Because they all provide two strings. Remember that Every Java object has to have a two-string method. Now, the last thing I'll leave you with today is, but it's also clear that Java knows what kind of object. So when I call print anything and I pass it choo-choo, Java knows that choo-choo's a dog, even though I passed it as an object parameter. How do I know that? Because it uses the right two-string method, the one that's defined on the dog class. All right, this is where we're going to stop for today. Um, well, you know what? Well, we'll talk about the Liskov substitution principle next week. All right. Just a quick, you know, it's a good time in class for this reminder. I'll just leave this up while I take a question. Yeah. We'll talk about that next time. Yeah, gr great question. All right, just a reminder about this, this point of the semester, um, you know, I know you guys get stressed out. I'm happy to give out extensions on the MP. I do that every, every year. 
Um, don't cheat. Get an extension first. Um, I will remind you that we will not meet on Friday. I hope you guys have a great long weekend. Good luck finishing up MP1. I have office hours today at 4. I will see you guys on Monday.